Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to Careers, Life, and Yale's Thursday show. The topic for tonight's show is careers in investing in and building innovative biotech companies. And we are so honored to have three Yale PhD panelists with us for our show tonight. Greg Keeney, class of 05, Dr. Santiago Salazar, class of 18, and Levi Smith, class of 2019. My name is Yvette Solis Rivers. I am Yale College, class of 96, and I'm one of two co-chairs for the Careers Life in Yale Committee on the Yale Alumni Board of Governors. And we welcome everyone who's joining us tonight, alumni, as well as current students, and of course, our guests. So for those of you who are new to this Thursday night show, uh, it really aims to facilitate the sharing of wisdom from alumni to alumni, and also between alumni and students. It's really all aimed to help with career and life decisions and transitions. So we invite you to come back anytime for any of our weekly programs. We do have a show on almost every Thursday night, not next Thursday night because we have a holiday going on. Um, but I also wanted to say, please feel free to reach out to us if you have any ideas or recommendations for other inspiring Yaleys we could invite uh, to be on our show. And just a few announcements. Uh, before I turn the show over to our amazing panelists, uh, we are, you probably noticed that we're recording the show. This recording will be available on YAA's Vimeo channel if you want to watch it again um, or if you want to share it with all of your friends and or colleagues. Um, also, please do stay muted until we get to the Q&A. If you have a question, of course, you can unmute. It just helps to hear our speakers and our um, when folks are muted. Um, and finally, if you haven't already, I strongly encourage you to join YAA's Cross Campus. If you haven't heard of Cross Campus, not the physical one, the online one, it is an online community. It has more than 24,000 Yale alums on it. Um, it's, it's sort of like LinkedIn for Yaleys. It has alumni and students from all schools. And it really offers a great opportunity to network with pre-vetted Yaleys. So encourage you to join it. It's crosscampus.yale.edu. All right, so with that, I will turn it over to our discussion moderator, Greg Keeney. Great, thank you very much, Yvette. And good evening, everyone. And welcome to this webinar on careers in investing and building innovative biotech companies. I'm Greg Keeney. I'm really happy to be joined on this panel with Levi and Santiago, and I'd really like to thank the organizers for coordinating the event, as well as the Yale Biotech Club for the opportunity. This is a really exciting time to be in the biotech industry, where scientific ingenuity and innovation are able to meet unmet medical needs and transform our healthcare system. And as you'll hear tonight, this dynamic biotech ecosystem relies really heavily on cross-functional interaction between biotech companies, venture capital investors, and worldwide collaborators. And what's really exciting is that the foundational skills that you're learning at Yale will enable you to lead the next wave of biotech companies in the future. And so with that, we'd like to tell you a little bit about the format of this evening's event. Uh, it'll be about one hour in total. Uh, each of us will begin in the first part with a few minute bios about ourselves. And then we'll turn it over to, to you to ask questions that we can uh, help to answer. And so we really want to encourage uh, active participation. Uh, we recommend adding your questions to us in the chat uh, field. They can be either be general in nature to any of the panelists, or if there's an individual in particular, you can mention that person's name. Um, and time permitting, we may have some live banter between us um, outside of the chat questions as well. Uh, we welcome you to keep your camera on uh, and mic muted uh, when you're not speaking. Um, and at the end, we'll close out um, at about the top of the hour. So with that, we'll go on to the first part with the individual bios. And I will turn it over to uh, Levi first to tell us a little bit about himself and his path uh, since Yale. Levi. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. Uh, so I'll start with getting to Yale. I'm Levi Smith. Uh, I am a PharmD PhD. I got my PharmD from Butler University in 2013 and went straight on to work, start working on my PhD at Yale. And when I got to Yale, knowing that I wanted to work in drug discovery, 
um, my whole focus was on getting the experience during my PhD to avoid a postdoc at all costs uh, and to get into industry straight out of my PhD. So I joined the lab of Steve Stripmatter uh, down at BCMM, uh, was working on Alzheimer's disease, so molecular mechanisms of disease and some pharmacological interventions therein, working in preclinical and cell models of Alzheimer's disease. And at the end of that, ended up doing a fellowship with Canaan Partners. I was a venture fellow for them for a year uh, at the end of my PhD. And then from that, jumped into a company that they were creating called Halda Therapeutics with Yale professor Craig Cruz. I was one of the first employees there, helped get our cell biology up and running and led some of our early programs, uh, working in a really exciting space in pharmacology that hadn't been pursued before. Uh, after several years at Halda, I had the chance to join Samsara Biocapital and did so just over a year ago, which was accompanied by a move to the West Coast, I'm now in Palo Alto, and work in biotech venture capital. We invest across all indications and stages of development, um, are very opportunistic, and that's one of the things I enjoy the most because there is an incredible amount of variety uh, in my, even just within the day uh, of what I get to think about. So it's, it's really been a dream job for me. I'll pass it back. That's really great to hear. And I think there are a lot of good things to pick up on there in terms of the breadth of your, your expertise, as well as the uh, aversion to a postdoc. I'm sure, uh, I'm sure you're not the only one. Uh, Santiago, over to you. Sure, yeah. So hi, everyone. I'm Santiago. Um, actually, Levi and I worked in the same lab together, so we're, we know each other pretty well. Uh, but yeah, so I'll, I'll work myself uh, backwards. I'm currently an associate at Oberlin Capital. Overland's um, you know, primarily a, a healthcare-focused investment firm um, focusing on uh, biopharma, medical devices, uh, those kinds of investments. And really uh, different from Levi, it's, uh, we invest in later stage companies. So registrational stage, companies have data in hand, they're getting ready to file with the FDA for, for approval of their product, or they just got approval um, have, uh, uh, you know, getting ready to launch commercially. Turns out that's a very expensive process and it's, you know, half the battle, you have to get approval and then uh, sell your product. Um, so I've been there for a little bit over a year. And prior to that, I was at Elector, a um, biotech company in South San Francisco. Um, went, to, uh, went, went to Elector straight from my PhD um, and really dovetailed well with my expertise at I, uh, you know, kind of learned at, at Yale during my PhD. Uh, I was on the immunoneurology team as a scientist, doing everything from discovery to preclinical research, um, IND enabling studies, really outstanding team, had an amazing time. Um, and then prior to that, um, as Levi said, we were in uh, Stephen Stripmotter's lab, working on Alzheimer's disease and um, neurophysiology, those kinds of uh, uh, things. Maybe I'll, I'll pause there. I guess um, to mention, you know, since this is more of a career focused talk, um, during my PhD, I, I was already interested in kind of the investment and business side of biotech. So I also did an internship with Canaan Partners, and I was also was a uh, Blavatnik fellow uh, while I was there. So yeah, I'll pause there. Excellent. It's really great that you two have a uh kept in touch after all these years from, uh, from your graduate experience, which is great. And that's uh, probably a theme we'll hit on as, as an important aspect of uh, everyone's career development as they, uh, as they transition from Yale. Um, so I'm Greg, it's really great to be here, really fun to participate in the, the Yale community. Um, and to tell you a bit about myself, um, I really got interested in chemistry when I was in college at Tufts University and its, it's potential to impact human health through drug discovery. Um, and so I was fortunate to do an internship uh, at a pharmaceutical company there uh, called Azi. And I met a mentor, uh, Ted Sai, who actually was a Yale alum, who encouraged me to go to, to chemistry grad school at Yale. Um, so I, I took his advice, we went there, um, worked with John Wood on the complex uh, synthesis, synthesis of complex natural products. Um, so learned a lot about how to make molecules and, and really how to apply that to drug discovery and have really great experiences from my, from my Yale days, not only the, the lab, lab based work, but also just the camaraderie and involvement in a lot of the different areas of um, the graduate student assembly, GPSS, and the chemistry department had a really great softball team. So good, uh, good memories there as well. 
So after Yale, I went on to work at Infinity Pharmaceuticals in Cambridge as a medicinal chemist working in oncology drug discovery. Um, really great experience in terms of the, the science of how to do industrial med chem, um, and also just a great company environment, um, keeping in touch with a lot of the folks from there as well. Um, from there, I really got the itch to start smaller and build something from the ground up. And I went to H3 Biomedicine in Cambridge, where I was the sixth employee. Um, and when you go in that early, you definitely wear a lot of hats. You, you transition from meetings in you know, highly technical disciplines to meetings with architects, to meetings with uh, human resources to build the team. And, and I really got a, a thrill out of all that, that type of experience. Um, in my career, I started to move later in the development cycle, um, away from early discovery and more toward uh, what's called CMC development, chemistry, manufacturing, and controls. Um, this has to do with getting drugs from discovery and into clinical introduction. And so I joined Ataxion Therapeutics as its third employee uh, in 2015. Uh, we merged with another company to become Cadence Therapeutics. So got some experience with um, biotech company mergers. Um, and then a few years ago, I moved on from there to Third Harmonic Bio. Uh, we are, I was the, the third employee there. And we focus on the treatment of allergy and inflammation. And I oversee a range of different research and development activities. So it's been really awesome for me. I've, I've loved kind of being a scientific entrepreneur and, and drug hunter. Um, and, and I look back fondly at the, the foundational knowledge I got at Yale to, to start my, my career. So I think that's really, really great from the sort of intro bios. I can see that um, we, have, we have some uh, banter in the, the chat. I'd really love to you know, take a moment and encourage everyone uh, who's on the call to uh, drop any questions you have in the chat. As I mentioned, um, they can be general. Um, they can be directed at, at individuals if you drop the person's name. Um, so please do uh, introduce some additional uh, questions. And, and while we're waiting for that to populate up, uh, what I'd like to do is ask, ask each of the panelists, we'll start with Santiago this time, a, a question that I think is really relevant to a lot of the folks who are listening, which is, you know, there's a lot of differences bet between doing academic research at Yale and then transitioning into industry. And so, Santiago, what would you say would be some words of wisdom uh, that could help listeners navigate their life after Yale? So were there any surprises or differences you encountered in your professional life after Yale that you could share with, the, with everyone and, and what you <laughs> learned from it? Yeah, um, I think uh, maybe a fun surprise was, uh, you know, Going from my PhD to a lector, um, I think I was employee like 50 something, so slightly more established than probably what you were working with, Greg. Um, but um, I honestly didn't know what to expect. Uh, you know, at the bench in grad school, you're really kind of leading the whole uh, program, essentially uh, doing basic science, running Western blots, uh, you know, all those kinds of experiments. And it was actually very similar in a sense. Um, I, I just, you know, I, I would get warned by uh, PIs and professors, you know, you're just going to be a robot kind of pipetting PBS from, you know, one tube to another. Uh, but no, it was, it was actually, I had a lot of autonomy in the projects that I was doing, how, you know, it's, it's different questions that you have about a particular molecule or target. And uh, you're given the freedom to go and explore um, that answer however you, you want. Uh, so that was really great. Um, and you know, just the, the rigor of the, uh, the scientists at Elector was as good, if not you know, better than uh, my peers at, at Yale. So it was, that was a, a nice surprise. Yeah. Awesome. Levi, yeah, any, uh, think, any surprises for you? I think to add to that is uh, how teams-based industry is, right? You get to success as a team uh, on these programs, right? Everybody has individual things that they're accountable, but at the end of the day, these are far too large to move on your own. And the, the breadth of expertise is more than any one person is going to have to move these kind of projects forward. Um, and so I think learning to let go of if I'm not the one who has, you know, their hand directly on this piece of, of a project, um, one, how do I trust that it's done well and to my standard, right? But also, how do I share in that success um, rather than necessarily being worried about 
uh, being identified as being pivotal. I think that's a big one. I think one of the other, again, I'll add a uh, happy surprise or I thought I was prepared for and wasn't, you know, having really focused on doing work with small molecules and, and focused on drug discovery during my PhD, the scale of research in industry is entirely different. I mean, I, I had even before I came to Yale, I'd spent uh, two months at Eli Lilly working with the musculoskeletal drug hunting team. Um, at the time, I was too naive to appreciate the absolute just breadth of research that was going on. I mean, we can generate in industry the, the amount of data that it takes years to get done in academia in, in a matter of weeks, um, partly because of resourcing just purely on the financial side, um, but also just the approaches that are used to ask questions are done at a scale that not only give you um, very data rich answers, but also are intended to be very high confidence answers if you're asking the questions correctly so that you can kind of move forward in your knowledge uh, as you progress to fully understanding a program. Absolutely. Yeah. And that echoes a lot with, you know, my thoughts around the biggest distinction between academic life at Yale and industrial um, biotech life. And it's really that that uh, the value of cross-functional collaboration and contribution. I, one of the things that always struck me is that in a graduate school environment, you, you're surrounded by your peers that often have a similar depth of knowledge of your scientific expertise, and that's your audience. When you go to industry, it's effectively the opposite, especially at these small companies where you might be the only person, for example, who speaks chemistry as a language. And so a lot of the tactics that you use previously to convince people of what you're doing or influence folks that's the right decision no longer resonate if you stay within that silo. And it really, it really is, I think, folks who, who excel in these broad-based kind of fast-paced environments have the ability to um, distill down the key attributes of what they're doing um, to a broad-based audience and contribute cross-functionally. Um, and I think that's one of the aspects that um, it, it's a little bit, it's almost a little counterintuitive um, coming out of an academic environment um, where sort of that, that level of you know, detail and extreme rigor that often accompanies a PhD program it can actually be a deterrent in industry. If you get too bogged down in the weeds, you really want to be able to see the big picture, see the macro objectives, um, and work with colleagues, as Levi said, cross-functionally as a team, because as individuals, contributors, the, these programs don't function effectively um, in silos. So um, a lot of thematic uh, similarities between our, our experiences and sort of that importance of, of cross-functional communication. So I'm checking out the chat. I see one co comment, one question from Rob. I'd really love to take a moment to encourage the, uh, the 30 or so folks who are on to really uh, think about some other questions while we, uh, while we field this one. So Rob, very nice to, uh, nice to reconnect with you. It's been a few years. Um, if you're online, would you like to, would you like to speak? Would you, would you like to read out your um, question sure. to us? Sure. Hi, Greg. Hey. Thank you for uh, being here tonight. Yeah, maybe we'll see each other again in Cambridge with the, the Yale Biotech community again. That's um, right. And and my question, I think you've actually started to foreshadow it because my question is about how do you, you're commenting on your journey from being a high achieving scientist to being a manager and leader of others where going from what your achievements are doing to having to influence and and impact others. Um, just what you were saying about going from detail and rigor to seeing the big picture and connections may be one of the pieces of your journey. I'm just curious uh, to what extent you've gone down that path and your experiences. Yeah, it's it's a really it's it's a it's such a critical component of I, I think being successful at these small companies because you you really are are interfacing with folks who are often you know not not well versed in your particular um, discipline. And I think a lot of us who, I, I think by nature kind of like thrived off that kind of detail oriented uh, uh, sort of, sort of you know, what I've heard referred to as helicoptering down in terms of just the, the minutia, we kind of get a thrill off that. You have to kind of helicopter back up and really think about, okay, you know, is this really the best use of my time or can I like use my skills to see a bigger picture you know, interact cross-functionally. And I, I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll plug sort of the, a chemistry PhD background in particular in MedChem, because I feel that, 
you know, very often our field is so heavily integrated in things like drug metabolism and toxicology and cell biology and biochemistry and intellectual property and regulatory and quality. I could go on and on. You have to have kind of a sense of what each of these things are. And it's a bit mutually exclusive. It's impossible to still kind of run the gamut of sort of detailed everything and have a foot in all those ancillary camps. And so it's, it's, it's a little unnatural. I mean, that would be the, it, it's unnatural for me. Um, it's probably a lot of, it's probably unnatural for a lot of folks coming out of a science PhD where a lot of your value is um, attributed to that level of rigor. And you kind of have to let it go a little. Um, it's not always easy. I can I can personally attest to that. So, um, but it's a really great broad-based question. I guess um, I don't know if you had a media follow-up, Rob, or I could hand it over to the other panelists to uh, to chime in. Well, let's let's hear from uh, Levi and Santiago too. Yeah, I think Greg's hitting on a communication thing that's really interesting, right? And and as a fu as a function of how integrated the teams are, you know, when I was at Halda as my first job out of my PhD, my chemist that I was paired with. You know, had a decade plus experience in pharma as a chemist leading programs, right? There, but and and wanted, you know, and needed to understand the biology, not of, of like not only the big picture of, you know, what what it is we're particularly trying to do inside of a cell, but also the data that we're running to actually inform the structure activity relationship that we're building, right? And so, this is somebody who's much more experienced than me, but I still need to be able to communicate my sign and then me also being able to learn back so that when we've got you know x number of compounds have come in but we need to prioritize you know based on certain chemotypes or features that we're really trying to explore right you have to become a teacher of your space as well and make sure that you're able to teach to the level of your listener um, and i think that's really the, the core part of what greg was pulling out as well yeah i guess kind of uh, going off of that levi having um having empathy to whomever you're talking to, you know, I think uh, can go a, a long way. And I don't know how really to describe it, but I guess just emotional intelligence and uh, yeah, just talking to your teammate or um, your boss, um, just having that that rapport uh, with them is, is really important. Yeah. And I would add too, and I know Rob does a lot of uh, leadership coaching as well. I think one of the, um, and feel free to comment on this, Rob, too. I mean, I think, you know, one of the most uh, revealing things that I, I've I've taken is, uh, you know, you, you can take these personality tests that give you a sense of your levels of things like empathy or um, uh, sort of what what are your triggers to, to, to make you unhappy. Um, and, and it's actually really insightful and, and I think some of those profiling personality profiling studies um, have helped me realize some of the areas that I'm less sort of comfortable with but it also helps me interact with folks who are kind of a picturing that's is usually a circle and you kind of get pinned in one of the quadrants yeah. very often you, the, the folks around the opposite side of the circle are the ones you often disagree with the most and I think being able to change your influencing style and think about how they might think, which is different from how you think, has at least helped me, um, you know, communicate cross-functionally. But I, know, I can see you're nodding, Rob. I don't know if, you know, with your expertise, yeah. if you want to chime in at all on that topic. Well, I think you're hitting on two key things. One is just my observation is that the best managers and leaders and probably the best achievers really know themselves. And that opportunity to, to take some of those self-assessments, it gives you a language to understand yourself in ways that you wouldn't have before. Um, I think the second thing is is um, having the big picture about where are we going in mind, uh, and and I think you've made a compelling case about uh, I would have heard about the teamwork involved. It's not just about what you do, and so how do you align in that vision, and then um, figure out what each person's role is going to be to get there. Those are those are some of the things that come to mind. But uh, yeah. Um, I, I I love I love the idea of trying to figure out what is the secret sauce that helps you go from being an achiever to a leader. That's what I'm spending my my life in career on. So appreciate your uh, sharing some some of your experiences. Great, thank you. I see Iris has asked a question in the chat. Um, Iris, would you like to 
just say sure, it out loud absolutely. here. Yeah, yeah go for it. Um, it's Iris, by the way. I'm oh, I'm a sorry. I'm a PhD in pharmacology. I'm going to be starting a job at BVF Partners when I graduate in the spring. Um, I wondered specifically more so for Levi and Santiago, how did you kind of set yourself up for success as you started those roles? Do you have any thoughts on things you wish you'd known while you were starting? Um, I guess I can jump in. Um, I don't know. Um, I, I think the what's helped me the most is that maybe just having a, a group of people that um, are nice and understanding. <laughs> um, and asking, you know, you're going to feel like you're asking a dumb question or, um, you know, I should know this um, and uh, just ask it. Uh, don't don't be afraid to ask a dumb question because uh, chances are somebody else has asked it. I've definitely asked them, uh, and uh, it's it's been helpful. And I think you know if you have somebody who's understanding, um, the it, it'll it'll make it easier. Yeah, I don't know, Levi. Any advice? Um, I guess advice is hard. Maybe well, in terms of what I would say, be prepared for at least in my experience is it goes fast. Uh, it's slowed down in the last six months. Um, but, you know, um, in 2021, I mean, it was blazing fast. Um, so it's going to take a lot of um, response. I'm trying to think of themes that are kind of more generally applicable to the group as well. You know, doing your own self-management in terms of um, projects you're working on and kind of keeping an eye on the ball and how it's moving and doing that in real time. Um, just the pace of the industry doesn't really let you uh, let up too much uh, on what's happening. So you've really got to keep all the balls in the air and just figure out which one you've got to toss a little bit higher. Um, so you've got more time before it comes back down. That would be yeah. uh, something I'd, I'd, I'd start with a real intentful effort on in the beginning. I see that Victor has added a uh, question in the chat. I see, Victor, are you able to uh, to ask your question directly to the panel? Hi. Uh, everybody, um, I'm asking this question um, as someone who, who's a business person rather than a scientist and has worked with um, top um, uh, biologists in, in, in trying to uh, apply machine learning uh, to trying to solve uh, prediction problems. And, and I, I asked this question from the standpoint of just observation of, of of some of the things that have been an issue in, in terms of uh, applying machine learning, um, you know, which is on everybody's lips and you know and so forth, is that um, biologists really think of data really differently than machine learning people, and what I mean by that is that uh, you might think of it uh, sort of. Uh, intuitively, you might use data not in the way a machine learning scientist might use it, but uh, uh, think of it this way um, as a, sort of a gross generalization. Um, machine learning scientists like to use data in a wholesale fashion. They need to have enough data to feed the algorithms. And, and really, that means setting up uh, the research and experiments to be able to actually obtain relevant data uh, for the intended uh, uh, predictions. And, and what I found was in, in working with really some top-notch uh, machine learning scientists from, from Carnegie Mellon, including uh, Tom Mitchell, who was the founding chair there, uh, was that a lot of times, uh, there wasn't enough really suitable data. Um, and just to give you an example of this, uh, I'm, I'm sorry being long-winded here, um, it, it is that um, if you look at uh, what DeepMind has done with, with protein folding, um, and it's wonderful. I mean, it's an incredible breakthrough, uh, what, what they've done. Um, but but I remember one of Frances Arnold's tweets about this, and she said, "That's great. You, you guys have gotten to 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 folding and, and, and structure. Now tell me about function." 
<laughs> and that was a big problem. So I, I think a lot of times what I see is there's a problem in how you think about what type of data you collect, how much of it to collect, and what you need to do to actually feed the algorithms to get the results that you want. Uh, so I, I, I'm saying all this to, to actually get your feedback too on what you, in your experience, uh, what you've seen. Oh. I, I could chime in and then Santiago, Levi, feel free to add in as well. I think to, to your point, Victor, I think a lot of the, the quality of machine learning inputs is paramount. I think it's, um, there are a lot of companies starting out with you know, various machine learning approaches, especially in the drugs discovery arena, when it comes to chemical structures, for example. Um, and I think, I think a lot of it will have merit in the future, uh, but much like a lot of uh, kind of the early days of um, say combinatorial chemistry or, or other sort of nascent technologies, the, the, the devil is in the details and, and it's going to be, and I think some some companies will will find that special sauce, and others others will not. But it, it's definitely you know something that is very common in discovery um, these days, and I expect it to continue to um, take a larger and larger role. But also will have its kind of ups and downs as as the field matures. I don't know if Santiago or Levi, if you have anything you'd yeah. like to add on that. Um, I don't have too much experience with it. I did use a little bit of it as tools um, in my research and. I think one really important aspect is validating whatever outcome you come out with. There's a way that you can uh, validate really truthfully um, to show and demonstrate that um, your model is working, I think is really key um, because you know that, that'll tell you if the data you're putting into it is worth it or not. Uh, the only thing I would add would be from an, I can, from the investment side, I'll say like we see a lot of this, um, but a lot of what we don't see though, is it being reduced to practice. So probably the most common theme that, that I'll see is somebody has a compound or a protein or something they've designed and they say, look, we've built this AI ML machine behind it um, to generate the next one. And the question is, well, did you discover the first one with that? And it's no, it was built backwards, but we can rediscover the one that we have that we built backwards on. There's a lot of that. I'm sure Greg's seen it a hundred times. And, and the ones that we get excited about are the ones that, look, we've reduced this to practice in this use case. We want to explore this new use case. We think it's going to be even more impactful. We've got a couple more hurdles to get over. Um, but that's, that's a lot of what I'm seeing on the investing side. Agreed. Looks like Nancy Stratford has a question. Nancy, would you like to, um, to ask it verbally? Yes, and thank you all so much for um, being available to us this evening. This is fascinating to me. I thought I heard early on a mention of bringing a drug to market, and uh, if I did, can you please describe the challenges of that process? And if I may have misheard, are you working on very early stage development? And if that is the case, how do you determine benchmarks for that, please? Thanks again. Yeah, that's a great question. Maybe yeah, Levi, would you want to? Would you like to start uh, answering that one? Yeah, I'll, I'll say a little bit. I mean, Greg, I think you're the best position to do it. At the bench, my research was discovery stage, um, and we were working in a space of, of drug mechanisms that have never even been used before. Um, so it was a lot of. I got to play for a while, frankly, figuring out what works and what didn't, um, and that was one of the best parts of the job. On since I've moved to the VC side. Um, I'll, I'll comment on the benchmarks piece because I'm sure because I know Greg will be you know um, kind of exclusively able compared to something I to speak to that part. But um, you generally are trying to do better than something that's already out there, right? And so from the beginning, you kind of set how much better do we want to be. You identify what experiments are going to tell you if you've if you've made it to that case or not, and you can kind of build a road path to that demonstration to that major experiment that's going to say, wow, like we're doing something the others can't do. Um, and that's what you're striving for in order to get to differentiation. In cases where there's never been a treatment before, right, it, it stems from understanding pathophysiology. You have a strong conviction in a target, you know, this is the disease, this is how it happens. If I can change X or Y, I'm pretty sure that it's going to have an effect on disease. And then we can always rely back on genetic models or, you know, what, what might not be tractable pharmaceutical interventions, but might be able to give us a proof of concept for a, a target. 
Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would echo everything Levi said, every, that all applies certainly to, to early and mid-stage discovery where you're looking at target validation and, and in the case of small molecule research, um, identifying viable chemical matter to, to modulate the function of a particular target. Um, I would say even more broadly, just you mentioned around benchmarks. I think there are a lot of discovery, early discovery benchmarks are, are sort of internally driven. Um, cutoffs around particular potency characteristics against a target, for example, or pharmacokinetic characteristics um, in animal models or efficacy. As you get into development, um, and by that I mean when a compound transitions into clinical study in humans, um, there's a significant amount of regulation uh, and regulatory bodies associated with um, appropriate uh, chemical matter to to test in, in humans. And so um, a lot of my job is is preparing uh, regulatory documents to show that, for example, we're dosing the right compound, we're not dosing it with copious amounts of impurities. We understand the rationale of why we're dosing, how much we're dosing, how frequently frequently we're dosing. And so there's a tremendous amount of checks and balances and they escalate significantly as they very well should. As you get into later stage clinical development, and certainly at, at commercial launch, um, there, there's a tremendous amount of, of, of effort uh, and time and money that goes into making sure that, that drugs are safe. And so it's a, it comes back to what we all touched upon in terms of that cross-functional integration of a range of different fields, uh, you know, commercial, regulatory, CMC, toxicology, et cetera, to make sure that the drugs that do get to market are, are truly safe and, and benefit patients and, and add, um, add, you know, add viable health-related contributions. And so um, the, the bar definitely gets higher as well it as it should as you get later in um, development and approach commercial launch. Yeah, I guess uh, maybe taking the big picture look, um, one of the kind of mantras at Elector was always, um, you know, really strong biology, genetic underpinning. Um, a lot of the time, you know, if, if you think about the probability of uh, you starting with an idea for a drug and making it all the way to market, probability is extremely low. And so if you can um, increase your chances by having really strong biology, um, you know, whether that's some kind of uh, genetic mutation and like precision oncology or something. Um, those are kind of some ways that um, uh, you, you can maybe reduce those barriers, those challenges. I see that David Yu has entered a, a more of a comment than a question in the, the chat around mentioning when he was at Genentech um, early 2000s using microarray, microarray, mass spec, mass spec to identify therapeutic targets. Um, David, do you have anything further to comment yeah, on that? Yeah, so, yeah, so it's more a question, uh, sort of like how the company approached this and to uh, mirror Salazar's comment, uh, our department was, uh, I was CompSci and MBMB undergrad, and the department was very uh, diligent about hiring people with both um, strong biology and strong computer science backgrounds to work there. and. And in that way, we're able to uh, mitigate risk by, um, you know, in the early days when other people don't have as much data to um, identify a bunch of targets and patent them and, and to supply, um, we're the first stage of research. So we supplied the later stages of research with uh, a bunch of different targets they could work on. And in, in that way, you know, Genentech wasn't only going for one possible therapy, but multiple um, multiple product lines that they can pursue and to make sure like some of them are successful. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's a really important point. And maybe I can kind of turn that into a question for Santiago and Levi on the, on the VC side, because I think it is always a balance with uh, portfolio management, exactly this, this challenge you wanna have, you know, I would imagine suitable diversification, but not stretch too thin. Um, you'd want to be in different therapeutic areas, but perhaps not too many. Maybe you could just comment on your your experience and, and your firm's experience around how do you how do you find that right balance? What is what is the right um, what is the optimal place to be um, where you can be most productive and and uh, 
least overstretched? Sure, um, I guess I can start. So I don't know, something that I've seen um, that I think maybe uh, makes some companies stand out is more of like a platform technology um, where if one target, for example, in, in your portfolio fails, it doesn't mean that the entire company fails. Um, you know, they're kind of like different shots on goal that uh, are not dependent on another. Um, so that, that could be a platform company um, or just, you know, maybe various indications with very different targets. Um, uh, yeah, that's... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the interesting things about what Santiago is saying on the platform piece, especially because you guys look at later stage stuff, like that platform is a bit more developed than if you're coming in at like the Series A. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so for everybody who doesn't know, the Series A being like the first like formal round of fundraising a company might do. There's there's earlier stages where smaller amounts maybe go in, but like a formal uh, round of money would be a Series A. Um, a company probably may not even have the molecule that's eventually going to be put into humans at that point. But when we're looking at companies in value and like the idea of a platform is de-risking is certainly true still, right? Absolutely. It means like first one didn't work, we can go back to the drawing board. But when we think about valuation, that company is really kind of living and dying on that first, that lead program because the platform is kind of a maybe there's there, right? It hasn't been productive yet. So like when you get to see companies, Santiago, I imagine yeah, that platform tends to be more developed and, and yeah. maybe that second one's not too far from being, being into clinical trials. Uh, whereas we're kind of like the platform value we're able to, to ascribe at earlier stages before it's proven out uh, is sometimes relatively less than the later. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and on the heels of that, I, I see we have one other question, which we'll get to in a moment. I encourage everyone to continue to, to populate the chat. I'd love to hear from you both about kind of, you mentioned sort of platform versus asset focused companies and, you know, biotech in general had a pretty rough year. Um, in the, the stock market. And, and I, I've heard some, if they're, I, I've heard some venture capital firms are kind of shifting their platform versus asset um, allocations as a result of that. But is that something that, uh, how, how are your firms thinking about that? How are you personally thinking about that? And, and just general reflections on the, the future of the biotech um, direction? Yeah. Um... Yeah. Yeah, I think, well, maybe your answer might be shorter, Santiago. Um, so I w the focus hasn't been platform to single asset so much, partly because I don't know that after a certain depth in that pipeline, right, there's not going to be that much to hold it up. Even with clinical stage companies, when you look at their valuations, right, it's pinned to that lead program. It, it's a, a marginal amount that then is then ascribed to the second program. I mean, unless they're practically parallel programs, right? If you're in late stage clinical development, the other is just about the inner clinical development. Those bring dramatically different valuations to a company. Um, for, so our firm actually is kind of unique in biotech in that we both do private investment, like in early stage companies. They might not necessarily be early, but they're just not public yet. But we also invest in public companies. So we have the option to play in both spaces. And that has been a, a pretty, that's where we've seen a lot of flexion. So you see private companies are having to really have had a harder time raising private capital recently. Um, that's for a couple of reasons. That's because those who can look in the public markets are doing so right now to look for companies that are undervalued. There's companies where nothing has materially changed about that company, about their science or about the patient population they're serving. Um, their valuation is just down because of, the, this gets into the weeds, but because of the people who are investing in biotech more broadly are moving out into what are perceived as safer spaces that means there's less trading going on in our sector in the public markets, and that brings prices down. And so when you have the option to invest in a company that you many times you already are an investor in, and you invested at a much higher price because you had conviction there was room to move up from there, if that company is still available for you to be able to invest in more at a lower valuation now, there's big opportunities for that. And on the private side, the other piece has been partly because of that focus as well, um, and as well as just risk management, there are people are doing fewer new investments in private companies. So that is a knock on effect. If I don't invest in a new in as a new investor in a second round of fundraising for a company that I wasn't previously. And that means that their investors need to invest more in it internally. We call that insiders. Same thing happens for companies that I'm in, right? If I can't bring a new investor into my company to invest, I have to support it more. Thereby, I don't have as much 
to go out and make a new investment in somebody else's. So we're kind of like, there's a bit of a defensive uh, strategy in this space now. People are preparing to do more insider support and to really be a bigger part of fundraising than we might normally have thought of doing when there were there was going to be you know a, a lot of external interest in coming in to a round. I know that got close to technical and was long, but I hope it was helpful. Dante? Yeah, I, I, I would add too, it's spot on with, I was reading Andrew Briggs's um, comment in the chat and it's, it's actually very in line with a lot of what you just answered. But yes, yeah, Santiago, could, could, you, uh, could you add to that? Yeah, um, I guess on our end, you know, we have, we, we do what's called non-dilutive investing. Um, you know, we're not taking equity in a company. Um, I guess our strategy hasn't changed too much. Um, there's still companies uh, filing, you know, uh, reading out top line data for the clinical trials. Um, I, I guess it hasn't changed too much. Um, we, you know, a, a big impact to the market is companies going public. And normally we're um, looking at companies, you know, years or, or months after they've gone public. So um, I guess with that respect, there, there hasn't been too, uh, too much of a change. Yeah. Michael's asked a, a very salient question in the chat that we can actually answer without getting political, I'm sure of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, Go for it, Levi. Yeah, I mean, I'll invite if Michael wants to add any color to it. Uh, it's been nice having everybody ask their questions, but also feel free, Michael, if you just want it read um, to say as much. Uh, yeah, no, thanks. Um, it, it's something I've heard that it, it will have an impact, but I guess I don't know what that means, it, it, it will investors look for, uh, look to be uh, investing in me too drugs that would not be commanding high prices if they were allowed uh, or, or approved? Um, or will there be more of an appetite to, to invest in something that really, you know, is first in his class and maybe could command a higher price because it's so, so different. So mm -hmm. I've, uh, yeah, so here you guys think. Yeah, and, and I'll just hit on a couple of the other points you put in the question chat in case anybody didn't read it, Michael, which was that as Congress moves towards reducing drug prices, and I, I think the other piece to put in there, Michael, is having passed the Inflation Reduction Act, which includes specific language around drug pricing and, and uh, negotiations, as you mentioned, by allowing Medicare to negotiate how investment and early stage opportunities be affected. Um, so I'm happy to, to start on it since I, I flagged. I'd be interested to see, Greg, what the conversations are inside as well. Um, people are aware of it. Obviously, it's major news in our space. So what's happened now is that Medicare uh, not only is allowed, but is actually mandated to select a, um, from their highest cost drugs are in Part B and Part D. And sorry, this is inherently going to get a little technical. What drugs are paying the most money on, they are now mandated to negotiate on. And that number increases over time. It's not optional. It's very specifically worded. They're required to negotiate the price of these. Uh, which will bring down the cost to uh, to Medicare directly. It doesn't necessarily affect private insurance, um, but for Medicare. And so what happens actually is that list is additive. And this was a big uh, vagity that was actually in the language, but the consensus now is landing on that it was intended to be read as cumulative. So in year one, we might negotiate on 10 drugs, and year two, 15, and then 20 per year after that. And that list gets cumulative. So as we look at a list, we, we if we have a list of 100 drugs in 10 years, less even, we'll be all the way through that list of drugs and we'll be start moving through what are maybe the highest cost drugs to Medicare, where they're spending $5 billion, $1 billion a year uh, in cost on those drugs, down to drugs that they're spending considerably less money on each year. So effectively, the entire range will ultimately be negotiated pricing. And the question becomes, will people still make drugs that are likely to end up on that? Now, they're high cost for a couple of reasons. They're high cost because they're being priced at a, at a high price point. They might be high cost because they're the only drug in a space, right? And they can command that price. Uh, and inherently, one would hope uh, is also making a significant difference for patients. Um, the pharma companies are talking about it. We've already seen at least two, if not three, that have specifically called out uh, this new legislation as reasons for why they've dropped programs. Now, I'm not the CFO of any of those companies, so I can't tell you if that's the real motivating factor. Certainly, some of them have even be que been questionable as to whether or not they ever would have made it onto the radar of those groups that are negotiating um, in a near-term manner, meaning would they ever have been, you know, in the top cost category for Medicare. Um, but, you know, it is being called out. 
one of the biggest distinctions is that small molecules, like typical chemicals you would think of, chemicals, I, I don't like that word, but they have um, a nine-year expiration before they're able to be negotiated against. And then larger molecules, I think it's 13, um, I'm blanking yeah, on it so. now, they have a longer period of exclusivity before they could be negotiated on after they're approved. So inherently, if I can develop the same drug, um, but I might be able to get paid for it, better paid for it for longer, I might skew my in that direction. There's a ton of other factors that go into why I would make a biologic or a small molecule that we can dig into. And, and sometimes they, it is not a choice sometimes between which ones you're going to use, but it's there. One of the most interesting pieces is that in the orphan, there's a specific carve out that drugs that are for an orphan indication, and that's their only indication, the only drug, the only disease they're approved for, they're excluded. And so what is interesting is that often you'll see an orphan disease, a drug for an orphan disease get approved in that indication, and then they'll start looking for other diseases they can treat, right? And they get approved in that indication as well. And so what we might start seeing is, you know, as we go through, and I'm sure I'm sure Greg has tried has had to split babies before in choosing his best to go forward, we may have two very similar looking candidates that we're ready to take into a clinical trial, and we choose one. But with this rare disease carve out, the orphan disease carve out, we may see where this one goes for orphan disease one, and this one goes for orphan disease two, right? Because now if one had both indications, you might lose that exclusivity. So there will be maneuvering. There will be a lot of lawsuits. It is top of mind, um, and, and it will probably – there will be decisions. There's certainly been um, publications about the number of drugs that won't be developed because of the lost revenue from that as well. So yet to be seen. How have you guys discussed it, Santiago? You guys look more at the commercial. No, I, I mean, I think the um, the orphan – drug um, angle is, is very interesting because sometimes for companies that's the whole strategy is you uh, go in on a, a small orphan indication very well defined uh, patient population with the idea that you go and expand to a much larger market uh, you know where a particular mechanism of action has uh, could have a benefit so if you can't do that anymore and now gets added to this list um, yeah I could see that that becoming a problem you guys had any conversations, Greg? No, I mean, it's it's a really great summary. I, I have some familiarity with it. Um, but as you mentioned, it's sort of, uh, it's early days. And I think uh, I think a lot of folks are exactly as you described, you know, trying to figure what what impacts and changes it will, uh, it'll cause. Um, keeping an eye on the time here, I see we have about seven minutes to the top of the hour. I don't see any immediate questions in the chat, but I'll, uh, I'll I would like to call a, a last call on questions. It'd be great to maybe squeeze in uh, one more question. You can, you can feel free to drop it into the chat um, or just just uh, speak out loud. Either way is fine with this. Uh, yeah. with agree. this we group. talked about surprises. What, what was maybe a challenge so we can maybe help somebody else get through it um, when they come to a similar challenge mm -hmm. that you face? Um, just in terms of- uh, in, terms in your of, career. Yeah. Yeah, I think, you know, when, you know, I think in any drug discovery and development program, you, you, uh, you, you, you really do get attached to these molecules. Um, and as I mentioned in, in a response to an earlier question, at later stages of development, the, the benchmarks are effectively set for you. You have to meet certain regulatory bars to proceed. In the early discovery space, it's really on the team. And different companies have different risk tolerances. And I think one of the fascinating things I've found at working at a few different startup companies is that um, there's a lot of subjectiveness and it can tilt both ways. Um, I think sometimes there's an uh, sort of over rotation on deprioritizing compounds just because of one less favorable data point when you, know, you, you could have powered through it and it still could have been a successful drug. Um, there are other examples where a particular compound or target um, has numerous liabilities over and over and over again. And because someone's, you know, maybe really eager to see it through, it just keeps going and going and going, perhaps not for the right reasons. And so striking that balance um, and just having that, you know, gut check and the team that can, that comes down to, you know, the cross-functional communication theme of, you know, really valuing the data and valuing disparate opinions and, and thinking critically um, 
and these are not these are not easy calls. Um, and it's it's really up to a project team to do its best what what, what makes the most sense from a, sort of a financial as well as just a, a, an advancement perspective to um, decide whether or not to continue with a particular program. It's it, there's no uh, there's no formal playbook. Santiago, any uh, any comments on on that vein? Yeah, I guess more of a, a I guess a, a practical kind of challenge is um, you know when you when you come out of your PhD, you're you're pretty good at what you do. So you know, like coming into a lecture, I feel like I, I had a good skill set and learning um, how to say no and, and maybe focusing on a, a few things instead of uh, trying to spin you know two dozen plates, maybe only spend a dozen. Uh, and learning how to say no to those relationships and, um, you know, what, just how to focus. Ian, I see you've raised your hand. Do you have a question or comment? Yep, go ahead. I see you dropped in the chat. Would you like to, to say it out yeah, loud? I was or would just you like typing. Yeah. I was yeah, just typing. It. So I, I just graduated from uh, our executive MBA program. Um, I've been working in the healthcare industry for a very long time and I wanted to get into like the investment space. So I'm wondering what kind of backgrounds or uh, do you commonly see in, in VCs? Uh, how do you think that pivot would happen? For, for, for example, yourself moving from scientist to an investment. So how does that transition happen? Or, or do you see other paths other than a, a PhD to pivot into, into investment? Maybe Livia and Santiago, you could take those and then maybe a one minute wrap up to, to close. Yeah, I'll try to be quick, uh, quick. And um, honestly, it's we're investing in science. So it, it kind of has to come science first. That's our perspective. Um, I spent I mean, I've gotten raw data from people before and processed it myself and, and graphed it out and figured out, you know, what was what was going on and, and was it being represented in the way that seemed like the right way to represent it. Um, so and uh, I, I feel strongly, I think, that one has to really be able to dig in and get comfortable with data and the scientific process to be able to interrogate it in the way that we do to invest in a company with a really long term horizon where they're going to be that company is going to evolve over that period of time. I'd love to go deeper, but um, I think I'll leave it there so that Santiago can share as well. Sure. Yeah, I think that's a, a good you know description. Both Levi and I have uh, PhDs and um, I think that serves like a really good foundation for, you know, looking at different opportunities. Um, just maybe more broadly, you asked what kind of backgrounds I see, and it's it's probably uh, a good mix of PhDs with industry experience or PhDs with um, consulting experience, for example, um, or I guess on, uh, you know, just my team in particular, there's people who uh, went into investment banking and then uh, more on the, you know, very um, strong financial background. Um, yeah. Great way to close. Well, with that, I think we will um, we'll wrap it up. I, uh, special thanks to Levi and Santiago for, uh, for their comments this evening. I'd really like to thank the organizers, Yvette, um, Kate, Chelsea, as well as Anna Barry for the, uh, for the invitation and, and again, the Yale Biotech Club. Um, you know, feel free to reach out to us after this um, Zoom session. We're happy to, you know, connect with uh, folks on the call. Um, happy to assist in, in in career advice, things like that. And um, with that, uh, hopefully, we can uh, beat Harvard this weekend in the football game. So with that, uh, <laughs> right. thank you very much for all uh, participating, and have a great rest of your evening.